Good morning and welcome to this session. I want to thank the organizers for um, putting on the event, obviously, and for allowing us to have this session, and for Elena giving a nice description of it earlier this morning. Thanks. So, um, yeah, this, this session actually grew out of a discussion I've had with some colleagues, uh, Harold Katzmeyer, Hans Lillienstrom, and Dan Fiskus, that we've had about for the last 18 months, trying to really think about, you know, what does system science have to offer, you know, to make the world a better place, in a nutshell. and. Um, and so we had been having this idea of having some set of workshops or conference or something ourselves, and then this came along and was like a perfect confluence of, I think, mission here. So I'm really glad that we have this, this space to, to do that. And, and basically the motivation is, you know, as system scientists, what, what can we offer? What can we, um, you know, again, like, like advise people, guide people, and so on. And I, I give talks a lot of times not to scientists, you know, just to community groups. And very well-intentioned at the end, they ask, well, what should I do? Like they just want practical information on a daily basis, like what they can do, either small things or big things. And, and I have trouble answering that question because it's like, well, change your paradigm. You know, well, that doesn't help somebody that just wants to, you know, do something a little bit better to tell them to change your paradigm. So I'm still struggling to give a good answer to that question. And I thought, well, I'll learn something if I bring a bunch of diverse and smart people together and they tell me what they do and what they um, have come up with. So that's really the motivation behind this session is to start to collect as many as possible different um, inputs on that question. So I have just a, a few framing slides, if you could bring them back up. They're coming in just a second. And so far the talks you've heard have been excellent in, in positioning this and framing this. So um, we have a, we have a full, full panel today. We have eight people. We're going to split it into four different panels. Each person will have 10 minutes. I'll give you um, a nine minute warning. And then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for questions of that panel. Then we'll come up with the second panel. Uh, we will have one person in each of the, uh, the two panels be online. Um, so, so we will manage with that as well too. But um, yeah, I mean, we've seen this yesterday, so I don't have to say it, but we are an overshoot, right? I think we all know that. Even with the COVID situation, you know, there was just a slight lessening of the impact, you know, by shutting down the global economy and transport for, for half a year, it still doesn't do much to actually change this. Um, I, I was pointed out that this 1.75 Earths is misleading because that's a global average. Of course, there's many of us that are at 5, 6, 7, 8, and others that are at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Um, so we need to layer this over uh, Albert's champagne glass and show that there's actually a lot of variation there as well. Um, so I think at the core of all this, and I think we'll hear more of this from the speakers, is that you know, it's really about uh, what we're trying to do is clean symptoms. We're trying to clean up messes most of the time rather than get to the core. And what we really need to do is shoot at that bullseye of what's causing these problems in the first place. And, and I would say that it's a deeply flawed relationship with nature and with ourselves. And again, that's hard to change, but that's really what we have to aim at. The other message that I always give my students, and hopefully in every lecture, is the fact that the problems we're trying to solve today are typically the solutions to yesterday's problems. So we thought we, we, had, we saw something wrong, we tried to clean it up, and that just leads to other later problems. Unintended consequences, lacking of systems thinking, lacking of appreciation of unwanted consequences. So, we can't ever get rid of that completely. I, I accept that. We have to do a lot better than we currently are. Um, 50th anniversary of Yasa, right? Happy birthday, Yasa. That's wonderful. 50th anniversary of the United Nations uh, first global um, uh, conference in Stockholm that we heard about earlier today. 50th anniversary of the Limits to Growth book, Me Meadows et al., wonderful. And 50th anniversary of this photograph. Right, so a lot was happening in 1972. Um, the last uh, manned mission to, uh, to space was taken, Apollo 17 took this photograph. And just yesterday they sent another rocket, I guess, right? They're, they're on their way, but not, not manned one, but at least the first steps of, of returning there. This photo really, I think, helped shape that environmental movement back in the early 70s because it was in that one frame that we saw all the resources, all the, all the wealth, all the, all the joy, but also the limits of that, that it's, um, it's one, one place. In fact, William Shatner, who was up in space, re re well, low Earth orbit recently, um, said that when he looked away from Earth, he saw death. He saw only death, and when he saw, when he looked back to Earth, he saw life. He saw, you know, living, living organisms, and so on. So, we have to recognize that we're dealing with wholeness and not fragmentation. We have to also realize that the Earth is emergent and organic. It's not a machine. 
And we have to celebrate the limits. We have to not look at limits as a bad thing, but recognize that limits are actually what's going to help us, um, I think, deal with the problems that we have. So with that, these were the four questions that I've asked the panelists to, um, to address, not, not necessarily all of them, but to think about a lot of the hows, you know, what are, you know, how are we going to get there? And so with that, let me go ahead and call up the uh, first speakers to the panel. And, um, and then we will hear from them in turn. So Hans, uh, Maybrit is online, uh, Dan and Sybil. So if you three want to come up on stage, Dan and Sybil, I saw in the audience. And I will turn it over to Hans to be the first speaker. <clears throat> is it just to keep, click it to come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was, okay. so okay, they will you. switch the slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, happy birthday, Yasa. Uh, it's, it's great to be back. I've been following Yasa for many decades um, and um, from Sweden, but uh, also coming here at several times. And thank you, Brian, uh, for, for organizing this session. I will uh, talk about, let, oh, sorry. Oops, oops. <laughs> I will talk about optimization of actions and focus on the, on the individual level of actions. And uh, I will talk about that uh, optimization. Uh, the optimization process is fairly simple if we just have one parameter, but uh, usually we have many parameters to, to consider. Uh, for example, the three pillars of sustainable development, or the 17 SDGs. Um, and we should also ask ourselves, what should be guiding in this uh, optimization? We, all, we have both rational and emotional uh, considerations to make, because uh, uh, neither one of them will be enough, will be sufficient. And uh, our own experience of a problem is the most efficient way to learn new ways of behaviors. So feedback of both rational and emotional kinds is also important to get when we are to optimize our actions. And of course, some kind of rewards uh, it doesn't need to be money. It could be any kind of rewards, for example, just to, to do good, feels good. Um, and uh, an example from the city of Uppsala in Sweden, uh, where uh, commuters that normally were uh, commuting from home to work by car were offered uh, free bus tickets for a month um, in order to, uh, if they left the cars at home and uh, took the bus instead. Uh, this was quite uh, a good incentive for, for many people to continue going by bus after this free month because the experience, the, the, the experience was quite good, they, better than they expected of going by uh, bus. So uh, this experience made them change their behavior. Uh, another example is the recycling. I mean, uh, this is actually an example of the quickest behavioral change in Sweden uh, that people started to recycle. Within 10 years, more or less, everybody is recycling their, their trash or their garbage and, uh, and things that can be recycled. Um, and uh, you, you don't get anything immediately yourself, but you really feel good when you, <laughs> when you do recycling. Uh, I think many people feel that, even if they don't see the gain for themselves. Another thing is just a smiley in a road speed regulation. If you see the smile, you actually tend to, to limit your speed better than if it just says 50 or whatever kilometers that you are supposed to, to, to have as a limit. So this kind of simple feedbacks may be quite uh, efficient actually to change your behaviors. So how should we act to achieve optimal or sustainable solutions? And what are the constraints? The important thing is to be aware of this. What, what, is, uh, what is going on when we, we often do this uh, uh, unconsciously in our daily life? We try to optimize our behaviors 
even the f don't think of it like that. But it's good if we start to think about what is happening when we optimize our, our lives, or how do we use our resources in the best way. And resources is not just natural resources, it's also our cognitive resources, and time is another resource. So how to maximize the quality of life, not just for ourselves, but for, for the rest of the planet. We could try to set up objective functions and try to minimize, for example, the negative impact of our actions. We could try to do that uh, mathematically in some sense, in, in terms of the functions of how much carbon emissions we, we produce or the, how we decrease the biodiversity and resource depletion, pollution, animal welfare, and so on. Uh, and try to, to realize that everything that we do affects the world around us. Or we could also, f and perhaps not uh, contradictory to, to the, the first minimization, we could also maximize our positive impact of our actions. Because we may have, as I mentioned recycling is a positive impact, I would say. And also we can increase biodiversity through our behaviors. Just stopping uh, mowing our lawns is one way to do it. Or we put up insects hotels to increase uh, the biodiversity around us. And many things we can do. And we can increase the happiness not only for ourselves, but for others, including other organisms, I would say. And we can create and uh, innovate. And education is, of course, an important thing where we can actually have positive effects. So it's crucial to become aware of the effects of our actions. And we should, of course, also be aware that sub-optimization often happens when we just look at one scale, trying to optimize a system at one scale. And perhaps another optimization would be if we, if we look at it at another scale. So once our goals are set, what determines our actions? Is it our reasons, for example, economic? Our feelings and mood? Our preferences? Our ideology or our habits? What is it actually that determines our actions? Is it our brain? Many neuroscientists or, or many scientists would say that all of this is part of your brain. It's your brain that determines your actions. But a, f a philosopher might say it's ourselves as agents, as subjects. Uh, that has no room in natural science. We don't have anything explaining the subjective aspect of life in natural science. Not yet. As sociologists might say that others influence or determine our, our actions, the society itself. If you ask a physicist, she might say that the laws of nature are determining our actions, or chance. Those are the only causes that physics can, can provide for our actions. Uh, my own research program, or our group, is working to, with decision making at different levels, trying to understand what happens in primarily in our own brains when we make decisions, uh, and trying to link the different levels of processes uh, actually, we are all decision makers. We talked about it uh, previously today about decision makers, but we are all decision makers. We make decisions all the time. And of course, it's not just us as uh, individuals, but we interact with other individuals. So, so, and their trust comes in as an important factor in this interaction. So, with our ner nervous system, we have a sensory hierarchy that uh, takes in what we perceive from the environment, but we also act on the environment. We are changed by the environment through our sensory hierarchy primarily, but we are also changing the environment through our motor, through our actions. 
And there's a lot of feedback going on both inside ourselves but also with the environment that we interact with. And one could say that the sensory hierarchy represents adaptation and motor hierarchy represents mitigation, if you like, if you take it at that scale. Uh, so decision making is an important aspect of our cognitive behaviors, our cognitive capacity. And uh, decisions are prior to actions, so every action comes after a decision. So what happens is, again, that we have two ways, if we simplify it, both rational and emotional parts of our brains are active during our decision making. And we learn through the to evaluation of the outcome of our actions. We learn to make new and hopefully better actions in the future. So we have constructed a neurocognitive model of decision making based on Kahneman's ideas on system one as an emotional and fast uh, system and system two as a rational and slower uh, system. And we have uh, identified different parts of the brain involved in this, in this um, different, sorry, let me see. Okay, thanks. So we have one emotional part and one rational part, and they, the interaction of these, we have used neural networks to, de to mimic or simulate the activity of the brain uh, areas, and the integrating these two uh, signals gives a decision. Uh, there's a competition between different uh, activities, and then an action, and the action on environment feeds back to both the emotional and rational um, uh, side. And of course, we also have uh, trying to apply this to uh, real world situation, more or less, uh, uh, decisions on a daily basis which is uh, how we transport from home to, to work. For example, we can take a car, public, or by bike. And uh, how do these different options uh, appear? They are represented by cell assemblies, the activities of different cell assemblies in our brains. So they are both uh, influenced by external stimuli and internal states. And we also have values that are considered, which are the three pillars of <laughs> sustainability uh, for the time being. And then there's a competition between the different options and uh, the winning option is the decision. So uh, we simulate the neurodynamics of the brain. It's like EEG signals that uh, for, for the two systems, so if we have, a f have to make a fast decision, system one works, and maybe uh, of these th three, three options, we take the car because it's most convenient, but if we think a little bit more and give it time to our decisions, system two kicks in, and we find that the bike is our option to win. So we apply this also to the planning of transport system in the Stockholm Mela region. And Stockholm is here, Uppsala is here. And this kind of understanding of what determines people's choices of transport is part of the planning. So finally, some implications of this is that our decisions and actions actually can affect the world much more than we normally think. And to be aware of what determines our decisions can be crucial for our existence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I should have given you a better introduction. I apologize for that. Uh, um, we, we met when one of your PhD students came to ISSP a, a long time ago, right? I, I think Elena remembers that year as well, too. But the, um, so, um, yeah, thank you. So our next speaker is online. And um, so if we could get Britt May on. So May Britt uh, Omen is an associate professor in environmental history in Uppsala University. So we're still staying in Sweden for now. And can you hear us? 
May Britt, can you hear us? You are muted. I don't think you can hear us. Is there another microphone that maybe? That she was hearing the handheld one during the break. It worked OK. But I don't see any reactions. Where is the handheld mic, actually, which we'll need later? Hello, host muted you. Unmute. Yeah, can you? But if she's not hearing, that's not good. Um. Yeah, I think, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Can you hear us? Um. I followed the live stream and it was uh, was still ongoing. So. Oh, so she's listening on the right. other version. It's a delay. Okay, well, we're ready to go. So if you can hear us, the floor is yours. You tell me when I can start? Yes, go ahead. The floor is yours. Can you message her that? Just say go. Well. The live stream is uh, uh, still showing the former speaker. Okay, now I'm on, I see. Thank you. Okay, thank you for inviting me. And um, so I will try to very briefly speak on uh, Sami and, and indigenous perspectives um, on environment and climate change and all. Um, I'm, Associate Professor of Environmental History and a PhD of History of Technology, and I'm also Luland Forest Sami with Tonedalian Heritage. I'm at Uppsala University and also a guest at Luda University of Technology. Um, well, I we'll, won't we'll stop here, but if you want to check out what I'm doing, so I, I, I'm the project leader of several research projects, amongst other, the Dalake Indigenous Climate Change Studies. Um, and you have my websites, if you want to see, I've been uh, amongst other deputy member of the Swedish Sami Parliament uh, in, during four years earlier. Um, so one question of importance is to that uh, I would raise from uh, indigenous and Sami perspective is uh, what has races and colonialism got to do with climate change and environmental destruction and working with feminist and decolonial scholarship, how it can be of support, which is my field. Um, one question I'd like you to think about is how um, the indigenous people's expertise on nature, climate adaption, management of natural resources uh, with long-term sustainability. Uh, why is it so unknow unknown or ignored or disregarded within uh, Western science and technology and by political decision makers? Indigenous peoples that you find around, around the world, uh, both in Europe, uh, the Sami are the ones who are acknowledged uh, as indigenous and in North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and also in Japan. And you have others in Africa, of course, around the world. Um, in a common view is uh, seeing settler colonialism as the foundation, the actual problem uh, from about the 17th century as the source of the problem with the environmental destruction and climate change, uh, introducing bad relationships lack of respect and care. It somewhat relates to the former, the previous talk here that you can, you heard about how we act. The question is, who are we? Because this uh, is part of indigenous way of relating with respect and care. And I would recommend you to compare with the uh, environmental historian, Carolyn Merchant's book, The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology and the Scientific Revolution, published in 1980. Um, I was just also thinking about this, uh, the, how people act. Um, and one thing that's of interest from an indigenous perspective is why is the norm to live in large cities? Why is, is the push towards cities so strong today? 
um, that we are buying food from stores rather than producing our own food to a large extent, and why are is it the norm to be employed by a large employer rather than being self-dependent for one's income and livelihood? Uh, so I'm within uh, history of science and technology, feminist technoscience, and uh, post-colonial feminism and indigenous feminists who are forwarding in very important points, challenging mainstream white Western settler colonial paradigm, destru being destructive to lands, waters, nature, and human. Um, we can see around the world how indigenous peoples are connected by this factor, all being part of territories that are under attack by the northern, modern settler colonial nation states. So we have several authors that write about this. And we will share recent history and ongoing massive industrial colonization. Uh, feminist technoscience approaches uh, have some tools to deal with this traumatic situation. Um, and feminist technoscience methodologies are close to indigenous methodologies in that re rejecting the idea of the scientific objectivity. I won't go much further into this, but I've written about it a bit, if you want to follow up on that. So Sami, I will go to the Sami territories. Uh, Sami have lived in this region since at least uh, the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. There, uh, we can find remains from that uh, traces. And the nation states were established from on the sixth, about the 16th century. Uh, we can see that Sami views on the relations to lands, waters, and non-humans differ, differ totally from the Western uh, modern exploitation view. Um, the first part you saw here was the, uh, the reindeer herding area that is a commonly described as a, a Sami area, but what I'm showing is that all the area where Sami have lived and still live today. And these are the reindeer herding areas of Sweden today. It's about 50% of the territory. So if we see um, the, the view on how to relate to nature, um, we can see that uh, we hear that both on, on everyday basis from Sami, but also it's, it's uh, uh, formulated in the environmental policy programs like from the Swedish, uh, the Sami parliament on the Swedish side. Um, I'm reading the first one here. From a Sami perspective, all questions are environmental questions since the environment touches on all aspects of our lives and our surrounding. Uh, and below, the Sami view of nature as an animated living being stands in strong contrast to Western view of nature. Oh, <clears throat> our view of nature is characterized, our values, customs, social structures, and relationships. Our view of life builds our common core value that is reflected in the Sami language. Sapmi, which is the territory where Sami live, uh, is our home. If we or someone else destroys it, uh, destroys its nature, our culture is, is destroyed as well. Uh, well, I'll skip over this, but it's showing my where I belong. Uh, so I'm using superdisciplinary research or feminist and feminist ind indigenous research methodologies. I collaborate, uh, I build on and collaborate with indigenous uh, uh, authors, scholars, and feminist technoscience, if you're interested. And I also have a lot of in individual Sami uh, and Sami associations collaborations ongoing. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I won't step read out this all, but I refer to this as superdisciplinary, superdisciplinary research. Um, so what's going on right now, what you see is um, Sami continue to do an everyday struggle for Sami livelihood, language, culture, and it's a never ending story, in particular over the last 200 years. Um, and we can see how Sami is trying to live one's life under the uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish and Russian occupation, you can call it, because it's colonization, settler colonialism. Um, and there's an everyday struggle to promote and strengthen Sami culture and, and life and livelihood. We have also, when you see Sami show up in media, is uh, for instance, the Sami protection work of forest, 
Uh, this is from the uh, 2020 Forest Rebellion, part of the Extinction Rebellion, um, trying to stop uh, the, well, the clear felling of forests in Sami territories. This is from May 2021. Uh, Amnesty SAPMI, our an Amnesty International actually joined forces, and there's an Amnesty SAPMI uh, group that is uh, raising the issue of climate justice for Sami territories. That's another example. Um, I'm going to mention a specific case here, uh, Jelivare Forest Sami village, you can see here on the map. And uh, here it's another pointing out, it's actually the territory here uh, of the Yalivare Forest Army reindeer herding area is uh, covering uh, the Lulio, where I am right now, uh, city of uh, where the Lulio Universal Technology is located. And so we've, uh, uh, Henrik is working, Henrik Andersson, who is a reindeer herder here in his 40s, early 40s now, has spent most of his uh, last decade to protect his lands and waters from the so-called green transition, um, where they want to use lands to put up wind power, which is referred to as being green. And so we made several collaborations uh, films where you can hear about his points of view amongst other uh, winds of destruction, uh, referring to the Dutch own Vasavin Angrin wind, wind power project that is threatening his lands. So this one you can watch, you can Google it, Winds of Destruction. Uh, let me see. So it's, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, the Vasavin Wind Power Company, uh, which is owned by the Dutch Pension Fund, APG was in January of this year by the Swedish Land and Environmental Court, granted the right to construct 57 up to 200 meters tall windmills within the reindeer herding grounds of the Yellowbody Forest Summit Village. And this will destroy their possibility to, to continue their livelihood. Uh, yeah, I will go on so you can watch this for yourself. Uh, we have made another film also that deals with another part, actually the state-owned uh, Vattenfall uh, power, wind power project that is uh, on a, another part of their lands, range herding lands. And this one, in this film, you can also hear Eva Charlotta Helstotter, who is a associate professor of water security, talk about the, the life cycle assessments and how they are made, uh, excluding most of the, um, both before and after uh, consequences on lands and waters, and also the the need for a fossil fuel that is part of the wind power. So this a film can be maybe of interest for you for to look at. Um, so just on this picture, it says, when you make energy anal anal analysis and um, life cycle studies, uh, you choose how to selectively limit them. Another issue that is uh, from indigenous Sami perspective is the Kalak Galuk plant iron mine in the Lula River. The Lula River already providing about can, 10 can you hear me? In Swedish Sorry, just one, one minute. Of electricity. If you can hear me, um, I don't think she can. Then maybe you could text her. And now there's a plan for a mine in within the river, actually just by uh, on on one in one uh, reservoir and by, by a dam. So there's been uh, work to to protect the river since 2012, and it's still ongoing. And uh, this is from 2013. Uh, uh, just uh, in March this year, the British government said yes to the mine. And this is a comment from Greta Thunberg, uh, which could be of interest. So we have several earlier... Uh, Brian wants to say something. <laughs> Yeah, just saying one minute, please try to wrap up. Okay, yeah. right. So I um, just want to show that we have several earlier examples of Sami protecting rivers and, and lands and waters. Uh, the Alta struggles in the 1970s, 1980s, and we have Sami working since the early 20th century or late 19th century. 
uh, with Karin Stenberg, Elsa Laula Renberg, uh, like this booklet, you can read Facing Life or Death, Words of Truth regarding the situation in Sápmi. Uh, and the first Sami Congress in 1917, Karin Stenberg, uh, uh, publishing in 1920. Uh, it is our wish, a request to the Swedish nation from the Sami people. So Dami, Sami have demanded rights since a very long time, challenging settler colonial destructive enterprises. And the work that you see today is a continuation of the work by ancestors to protect lands and waters, the culture for future generation and for non-human mm -hmm. relatives. I would say also the expertise here uh, is ignored, but indigenous people have knowledge of how to deal with forest fires, how to manage natural resources. Um, and I, I'm asking to academia to join in on this, to, to challenge. Um, I'll stop there. Right. And, well, Great. I can always talk more. Yeah, thank th you. Thank you very mu much, May Britt. <laughs> yeah. Very important and insightful uh, perspective. And, and when you talk about changing paradigm, it, it, it seems like we need to learn a lot from, from that paradigm. So um, thank you. Hopefully there'll be more in the discussion. Um, with that, let's hear an intervention from Dan Fiscus. Dan is, I think, the other main partner in crime of this whole session. But um, Dan is um, an R&D scientist at Berkeley Springs Lab in Maryland. So come on up, Dan. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate today. And congratulations to IASA on your 50th anniversary. It's an incredible event. Uh, special thanks to Brian, too, for organizing the panel and the invitation, and for being an excellent mentor and colleague for me. I wish to propose some action steps today um, with the theme of this panel. And I'm offering these uh, humbly, uh, basically hypothetically, uh, seeking your suggestions and collaboration. Uh, you might find some uh, connections to the previous speaker, uh, May Britt. Um, as Brian and others have said, and we've heard a lot last night and today, the problem we face is a wicked problem. Uh, you might hear people refer to a meta crisis, a poly crisis, climate emergency. Uh, we have uh, quite a few different ways to describe this. And I think, uh, as Brian said, it's really hard when people ask you, what should we do? Um, I think system science can definitely help answer that question, and as we've heard many times. I like to study this uh, as a multi-crisis, as a system of problems. So if we start that way, we can think of what, what is it that creates the system, what is it that unifies it, and then we can begin to seek a system of solutions. I also like to um, start at the beginning to say what kind of outcomes do we seek? So what kind of actions do we want? And the indicators and trends that we often see about the great acceleration and many other graphs can help in an interesting way, I think, to tell us what would be a successful action. So these um, vital signs that we've seen a lot, uh, as in the work from Ripple et al. when they were warning of a climate emergency, my uh, hypothesis and proposal I would suggest to us is that for full and true success, we need actions that reverse all of these trends at the same time. These and others as well. So that to me would be whole system change. That would be systemic change. And so we can ask what kinds of actions could do that, could change course on all of these trends simultaneously. And as Brian said in his introduction, a lot of the previous solutions are now our problems. So um, we'd like to uh, find a kind of change that's systemic and doesn't lead to worsening of trends in other areas. To seek systemic change and avoid piecemeal solutions um, that backfire, we need to seek that systemic change to turn all of these at the same time. So as we look for, think of actions, that would be success. All of these need to reverse course. So that's a high level, um, oops, that's a, um, 
high level of leverage that we would need to change the whole system. So Donella Meadows, who was mentioned also by Brian, uh, wrote the book, uh, co-wrote the book that came out 50 years ago, Limits to Growth, also wrote a paper in which she identified the top two sources of leverage for change in a complex system. And both of her top two sources of leverage had to do with the paradigm out of which the system grows. Um, so uh, she listed number one and number two in that way in her 1999 paper, and everything else grows out from that. The goals, the structure, the rules, the feedbacks, the information flow all come from the paradigm. So that's where I would like to look for this high leverage to change this whole thing and what unifies the crisis. And the hypothesis that uh, Brian and I put in our 2018 book, Foundations for Sustainability, is at the center of this, one way to think about it is actually um, the paradigm of science. Uh, it's the source of the root cause of the crisis, but it's also the greatest leverage for change. Given the stakes that we're facing, I think this hypothesis is worth testing. Um, the mainstream paradigm of science, of conventional science, that's dominated since the days of Descartes and Newton around 1600, and it has some central tenets uh, that we can identify. And a lot of this work borrows from Robert Ulanowitz and uh, Robert Rosen and many other people. So a lot of this, the main um, uh, core tenets of uh, mainstream science are reductionism, ob objectivity focus, analytical methods, and a mechanistic root metaphor. So with those acronyms, I call it Rome Science. Um, and the two key tenets that could, we could turn into actions that are, that are more actionable is that the first one, so the root metaphor within this science paradigm is the mechanism. And uh, Rome science treats all living systems or all systems of study as mechanisms at the root, including living organisms and, and living systems. The other one we can take action with is the objectivity focus. So Rome science values practice in which scientists consider themselves outside of the system of study. That's beneficial because it can prevent influencing the system or biasing results or conclusions. But um, the, are, there are some uh, negative, uh, unintended side effects of this paradigm, and we could hypothesize that this paradigm drives technology, which drives industrial culture, which has given us all of the symptoms that we see. And uh, the shorthand synthesis version of understanding that is we have turned the world into the machine that we have imagined it to be. The symptoms that we see, the world is very literally breaking down, wearing out, falling apart, losing pieces, and running out of gas. Those are behaviors of a machine. Those are not the behaviors of a living system. Living systems do the opposite of that. So we can think about an alternative paradigm and two things to get the, the Donella Meadows maximum leverage. We can first change our paradigm. So this is not the normal way that you hear about paradigm change. It's not a Cunian paradigm change. We're not going to wait for this to shift. We could do it intentionally. Um, the first part to do would be to change the, uh, to an alternative one, which has to do with a holistic worldview, organic instead of reductionist and analytical, and a root metaphor of living systems, not mechanisms. Uh, this is, uh, again, followed work of Robert Ulanowitz. He has shown in his ecosystem work and networks ecology that ecosystems are non-mechanistic. And I highly recommend looking at his work. He's developed process ecology, which is a non-mechanistic approach. We can see this uh, clearly with evidence every day. There are facts of life that show us that life is non-mechanistic. Uh, Earth's oxygen atmosphere, the way soils naturally grow in, de in depth and fertility, the creation of fossil energy sources, these are all evidence of this non-mechanistic behavior. This is also why these systems are inherently sustainable. So we could begin to transform our science uh, operations ourselves 
in a way, tra self-transformation, leadership by example, and we can work with our facilities so that they are uh, con uh, convert to 100% renewable energy, 100% recycling materials processes, and a net beneficial impact on the environment. And uh, we can do that uh, as one, three, five, ten years, as long as it takes, but as quickly as possible. If the hypothesis of a high leverage uh, paradigm change works, then we would see um, all of those trends begin to go simultaneously. It would also support uh, sustainable technology, which would support sustainable culture. This is yet another um, leadership role of Donella Meadows. She thought of a, a think-do tank where she had her science and her uh, sustainable living in the same place. Um, the second action uh, we could do, um, I just mentioned, change our facilities uh, so we can reinvent our own facilities in the image of a living system instead of the image of a mechanistic system. This would change that root tenet of objectivity focus to an intersubjectivity or internalism where we become part of the system. And David Orr and folks at Oberlin did an excellent example of this in the Adam Joseph Lewis building built in the year 2000. And I would like to note that this paradigm um, borrows and overlaps much with indigenous worldviews, values, and traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous people, including uh, ethic of reciprocity with the land. If we did this with lots of science utilities, facilities, we could get a lot of leverage. Uh, this would also spread to students, to collaborators. It would be participatory engagement with the uh, renewable energy providers, the recycling material folks. And then if it made sense or it played out, that would drive technology, which drives culture. And we would begin to get the symptoms that are more uh, associated with ecosystems in the biosphere regeneration, healing, and uh, new energy that would build. Okay. So in closing, I would like to share a quote from Albert Schweitzer. Um, For influencing others, example is not the main thing, it is the only thing. If we see all the crisis curves reverse direction and change after we implement systemic change at the paradigm, then we have some evidence that this is the shared root cause. The power and successes of the dominant science paradigm have unified science, technology, and culture into a single complex system. The crisis we see appears to be a crisis in industrial culture, but it may be a crisis in science. To transform science systems first in both paradigm and facilities could it be actions with high leverage and demonstrate leadership by example. And I look forward to more discussions on these and the other topics that have been uh, presented by the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, it builds nicely on um, Britt May's talk. Hey, Brits, excuse me. Okay, so the last one before we open it for some discussion and questions will be um, by Sybil Ecker. Sybil is a, a former and current EASA uh, uh, scientist, but also now currently assistant professor in systems dynamics at Rabat University in the Netherlands. So, Sybil, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction, and thanks to all the organizing colleagues for this conference and Brian specifically for this session. Um, so, as Brian said, I'm an assistant professor of system dynamics at Radboud University and a research scholar at the Energy Climate Environment Program of EASA. Uh, mainly, I work on integrating social systems to global models of climate, economy, and environment. 
And in the next 10 minutes, I will share my reflection on the, ten, uh, on the four questions Brian gave to us. Uh, but I can give a quick spoiler. My answer to all four questions is going to be modeling. Because modeling is the biggest hammer in the toolbox that I have. And today, I am choosing to go to all these questions with this hammer that I have. So the first question was how system science can help to address global ecological crisis practically. So my answer is modeling. As you have heard several times during this conference and as you will hear again, modeling is a key tool of systems analysis. It has been widely used starting with the world model of limits to growth that you see uh, uh, coded in the ancient software up there uh, to the modern uh, integrated assessment models that guide the climate policies today. It is widely used and widely influential because it has practical benefits. So for those practical benefits, I'm going to list seven, um, which uh, I will quote from the book of Scott Page titled uh, The Model Tinker. So the, the first practical benefit of modeling is its help its support for reasoning. It helps to trace the relationships between systems and systems elements in a logically consistent way. The second uh, practical benefit is the ability to um, is the ability to explain that the phenomena that was already observed. The third practical benefit is the design of uh, features of institutions, policies, or rules through testing uh, in, a, in, a, in a test bed, in a hypothetical test bed. The fourth one is communication, because the models help us to, to communicate the knowledge and understanding clearly. The the fifth one is uh, acting because it helps uh, the models help um, choosing different policy options, rules, and uh, uh, institutions that come with that. Uh, I, I forgot to count. The next one is predicting. We know that the models are great tools to look out to the future and see, estimate what might happen. And the last one is exploring uh, multiple plausible futures with what-if scenarios. So these are the uh, main practical benefits. And what I like most among them is the rigor uh, modeling brings to understanding different relationships uh, between systems and the consequences of those. And if you wonder what Shakespeare is doing up here, it's exactly to make this point uh, uh, of bringing rigor, because um, the, the complexity that we see around is like a madness, but the models bring uh, a method and order to, to this complexity uh, we see around. This brings me to the second question. The second question was about how system science can help transforming science in general to be more inclusive, especially that of the value of life. My answer is going to be modeling again, because modeling can be conducted in a participatory way in all the stages of it and uh, with different participatory approaches. And uh, participatory modeling provides a structured stakeholder engagement in, in various systems analysis projects. And this takes the discussion beyond mere uh, narratives. And it helps to um, move modeling beyond being a scientific, merely scientific tool. So if we talk about stakeholder engagement, then of course the question is who are these stakeholders? A few months ago I was uh, talking to a natural scientist and uh, I said in this project my role is to uh, do participatory modeling for stakeholder engagement. She immediately asked, so who are these stakeholders? Are they humans? So I guess the question was meant to be a bit sarcastic about this uh, precious species of stakeholders, but I took it uh, uh, as an intriguing questions, question because, yes, I work with uh, humans as stakeholders so far in my professional life, but I am very much interested in working with non-human stakeholders uh, because we see that um, in the last couple of years, 
rivers in many different countries of the world are granted the same legal status as humans. In Bangladesh, you see that. In Canada, you see that. There are projects to give independent, um, independence, independence to forests as um, independent legal and financial entities where they can govern their transactions through blockchain technology. So natural capital, the rivers, forests, will be our stakeholders. They are currently our stakeholders, but they are not in the room. Maybe they can be represented by the indigenous people, uh, but they are not there as uh, independent entities. And I am very much interested in engaging those stakeholders as well uh, through modeling approaches. So uh, once we decide on the stakeholders, then we have the process of modeling that uh, leads to an outcome. In the morning session, there was a discussion about the value of outcome and the value of process. Um, uh, participatory modeling contributes to this discussion because it leads to a better outcome, a better, more inclusive model. But it also leads to a better uh, process. Several empirical studies has shown that Participatory modeling leads to a shared understanding among the uh, stakeholders, among the participant, uh, participants, about the causes of a problem, and it leads to a consensus about the solutions for a problem. It leads to trust, and maybe most importantly, it leads to systems thinking skills. So this brings me to the third question. Um, I think there is abundant scientific evidence in the operations research and decision sciences literature that systems thinking leads to better organizational decisions. However, uh, the uh, empirical evidence about the contribution of systems thinking to uh, changing individual actions uh, and behavior is rather limited. Uh, a few studies I know of uh, more or less reach a consensus about the role of systems thinking, and they say that systems thinking alone is not sufficient to influence one's values and actions. Uh, here I mean pro-environmental values and behaviors. Uh, systems thinking alone is not enough. However, it activates an ecological worldview, and this ecological worldview leads to pro-environmental values and actions. Um, this study I quote here uh, is from the US. And you know, when we talk about values and behavior change, there is a usual suspect in the room. It's the political polarization. In this study, they show that systems thinking activates this ecological worldview and leads to pro-environmental values and actions, regardless of the political ideology. So both among the liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, the, the contribution of systems thinking is significant. However, I should also highlight that uh, individual action, individual behavior change is a complex subject, so systems thinking alone will not be sufficient to change one's own beha behavior. However, uh, it has shown that it's, uh, it makes a great contribution. Uh, then I come to the fourth question. Uh, the fourth question was about what kind of message uh, we would like to give to the others as system scientists. So if I am to give any message to the outside world about the global ecological crisis, that would be about hope. Because on a daily basis, I interact with uh, younger people, and I am deeply saddened by seeing them hopeless about the future. Or we see the climate activists crying in front of the cameras when they say how, feel, how hopeless they feel and why they uh, throw tomato soup to the precious paintings. So therefore, the message I would like to give would be about hope. And I know that system science deals with the daunting comp complexity that leads to um, uh, this ecological crisis. However, this complexity system science is trying to tackle also creates opportunities uh, uh, to solve the problem. As, uh, as mentioned in the morning's plenary session, this interconnectedness of different systems and system elements within one, uh, within one system can lead to cascade positive effects and benefits. These days, this is called social tipping processes. And yes, it's a popular word because it gives great hope about the so 
solution uh, by making small changes in, this, in the social systems and activating all these positive changes. So with that, I think system science and systems modeling can also help to uh, analyze these processes and can give hope to the outside world. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and perfectly on time. And you answered all four questions. It's amazing. This just died. I think the battery went dead on it, so I don't see anything on here. Uh, there was one question. I read it, so I kind of have that one down. But if there are more coming. And could we have a handheld mic also so we can have it at the, is there one up here somewhere that I'm missing? Somewhere in the room so we could talk from the seats and then maybe one for the questions. If, if there's some mics around, that would be good. So if there, uh, we, we, we're going to pause now while we have this panel on here and from these first four interventions and um, take some questions and, and have some, some feedback. So if anybody has a question or a comment they'd like to make, um, please raise your hands now and we'll try to also get the microphones. Um, one second for the microphone though. My name is Gustav Feichtinger. I'm from the Vienna University of Technology and from the Vienna Institute of Demography. My comments refers to the first talk and also to the last talk. Uh, the development of YASA during the last decades is quite opposite to the development in the first decades. When Howard Rafer and Holling and so on were the presidents of YASA, the leaders of YASA, mathematical methods played an important role. And now I have the impression that simulation or simple regression models are predominant. And in my opinion, this is a wrong uh, development. Uh, and I will give a comment on that. The first talk, in my opinion, it was until now the best talk of this uh, morning. And I like particularly the interaction between the emotional side and also the rational side to describe the real decision making in a neural sense. And I think uh, the presenter uh, took uh, uh, the, mentioned the different speeds that emotionally is quite, so, quite fast, while the rational uh, takes longer time. And I would refer to an other field uh, which uh, could be related in some sense and which was also treated in the former. Could, could, could uh, you, I'm sorry, but we really only have a few minutes. And so I just need a question and then we can get a response because I want to hear from in other In mathematics, people, so. there yeah. is a field in differential equations which is singular perturbation theory, dealing in systems <clears throat> with different speed. And I would draw the uh, attention to Sergio Rinaldi, who was a former co-worker and discussed here the love dynamics. At the first look, you have, uh, at the, you see your partner and so on, or a secretary if you have a matching problem in that case. This is an emo emotional field in a, in a very fast context. And then you have the rational decision maker that you weigh the different multi-criteria things in that issue. And I think these methods could be used to study this uh, uh, feed. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And for the feedback, Hans, do you want to? Thank you. Thank you very much for your suggestion. I, I will look into that. We have differential equations behind the, uh, with different uh, time constants involved in the, uh, f for the two types, the two kinds of systems that we are modeling. Uh, so I think uh, I will look into what you suggest. Thank you. One of, one of the other things you said, Hans, which I thought was really important, was that um, it's not about minimizing negatives, but it's about um, maximizing positives. I think too often people think of sustainability as just doing less bad. We can't just do less bad. We have to do good. Right? Wolfgang is in the room, right? Well-being should be our goal. So, um, yes. So, other questions from the audience? Also, I can also read the one that was online. But do we have one? Elena? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. All three talks, I thought, or all four talks, actually, were 
I think, very interesting in different ways and contributing to the topic very nicely and complementary. Uh, my question is the one I'm asking, not the first time in the Yasa's context, but I'm curious what you will say very briefly. So when we talk about behavioral change, there is an issue of ethical side of it. So the snatch theory, this kind of things, uh, and Hans, you gave a few examples. So who has the, who, who dares to decide who should change the behavior and how and what and, and to what extent and so on and so forth. We as scientists, are we taking the kind of responsibility for this kind of decisions? Or we are themselves referring to someone else as authority in this field, and so or we let people decide in hope that they can make the right decisions themselves. I guess that's not what we kind of see at the moment. So, how do you see this ethical side of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. May I, may I <laughs> yes, I think it's very important uh, that we as scientists can help people to decide for themselves and to realize what is behind their decisions, uh, what kind of processes, what kind of factors in, uh, influence their decisions. I think we should not make the decisions for others, uh, but we can uh, give tools to people to see how they can make a decision that is satisfactory uh, to their situation and to their situation in a, in, I think again, interconnected network of we are all a part of a, of a interconnected uh, system and uh, to see that whatever we do even whatever we would say has an effect on others and uh, i think this is an important uh, realization that we, we we should look at and uh, that we have um the, uh, the uh, tools to influence others. I think this is what we also see in uh, w when a new behavior uh, spreads in society, that uh, someone, our neighbor puts up a, a solar panel on their roof, uh, and we realize that this is a good idea. So, so it spreads very quickly, these kind of things. Um, and we, uh, they don't make the de decision for us, but they help with their examples to help us to make a decision to do the same thing, if we see it's good. The it same with recycling, for example. Thank you. And maybe you want to add to it, because your participatory modeling, I think, comes very close to this, right? And how you... Uh, yes, that can help for anything. But specifically about behavior change, I fully agree that uh, it's up to the individuals at the end. Uh, we cannot force uh, any, any change. And behavior change is... Um, uh, like already studied, it occurs as a combination of different individual social and structural factors, structural factors being related to infrastructure, economic situation, and the social systems. So science-informed policy can create this enabling context for behavior change. However, it cannot force. I guess we see this in all different uh, public policies when the public is advised to uh, reduce sugar consumption or reduce smoking, there are incentives or different, different campaigns to do that. The same goes for behavior change for ecological values and ecological changes. Uh, the second comment I, I can make on that, so there is almost this dichotomy between systems change and behavior change, but increasingly we learn and we understand that they, it's not a dichotomy. These are all connected because uh, behavior change in social systems leads to these cascading effects in the financial system, in the energy system, in the policy system, and it turn comes back. So they work hand in hand uh, in an open, inclusive environment. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just have one, one quick comment. I think uh, it's a great point and hard issue. I think if we change uh, ourselves as scientists and science facilities and science institutions, then we don't have to tell others what to do. Uh, it becomes an easier thing. We just tell our story. And it's still up to others to choose it, but we can show by example. Great, thanks. I, I hope that May Britt is still with us, because the one question in the iPad was for her, in fact. So if she's there and can hear me, the question online was about how um, we can include more of the indigenous 
perspectives in the climate policy, particularly the discussions that are going on right now and, and what, what role, if she's aware of some. She mentioned she was in, in the Sami Swedish parliament, but I don't know if she had any other insight for, um, for on a more global scale. Um, yeah, I would say there's all, some work ongoing, um, but it, it, I would say in general, it is the indigenous people's organizations working the hardest to make themselves heard. And if we see, go to Europe and Sweden, I would say, uh, I, I can see both Finland and Norway are doing quite a lot, whereas Sweden is not uh, really um, listening to Sami perspectives. Um, the European Union could do a lot better. Um, so it's, it's also different in different parts of the world, I would say. But in general, it's a, it's a decision makers and also people, at, uh, that's why I'm saying at, uh, in universities, uh, to make space for indigenous expertise. So I think it's also both like on state level, but also each like uh, uh, the scientists working in the university could bring in indigenous voices like you have done here today that I have the opportunity to, to bring them forward. But I think it's also having having courses, uh, university courses, bringing in knowledge and expertise and indigenous voices. So there are a lot of ways to do this. Okay, thank you. No, we're, thank we're you honored. For the I really appreciated your comments too about um, nature being alive. Right, so it's again that, that you, you remove fragmentation between living and non-living, you just recognize nature as alive, so. Okay, I think we should switch to the other panel to give them, them a chance as well too, so thank you guys. Call up the next four panelists. And if you can get Marina's slides up already, that would be good. Ursula, come on. Our first speaker in the second panel is uh, Marina Fisher Kozlowski, who I think many of you um, in this area know. She's the founding director of the Institute of Social Ecology and now Professor Emeritus with them. Um, she uh, really wanted to be here and she texted me this morning saying that she um, has, a, has a cold and, and is unable to, to, um, to physically participate either virtually or, or in person. But so I have her slides, she sent them to me. I'm gonna go through them fairly quickly. I will do a disservice to them, but um, I, I will do my best to try to share what she had prepared for us. Um, I, I do work in social metabolism a little bit, so um, I'll, I'll do my best with that. But these, this is what she had sent me this morning. And, and I'll try to just get to the, to the main point. So, but, but yes, she was one of the founders in the Vienna School of Social Ecology, basically taking a, um, a perspective of biophysical basis to, to, uh, uh, you know, to history and as well to, to economics, where you have both uh, um, you know, the population is interacting with the material world, but also with the, um, the human society's world. In fact, this is somewhat like the, the, the picture Hans just showed, I think in some ways emotional. And, and, um, and rational. But um, I, I think this is an important point here is that we've had these several different regime changes in how energies have been used primarily. The, the first big one was going from hunter-gatherers to the agrarian society, the, the Neolithic revolution. Um, then the next one was tapping into fossil energies. So the industrial societies that, that grew up with that and all the change that that had on the biogeochemical cycles. And then the question mark one, right? What is that sustainable transformation going to be like? Again, going back to some sort of solar renewable energies or, or the collapse option is always on the table as well too. Um, yeah, so that was the ones that we had. Um, also noticing that, that while um, the global population has been increasing, but the percentage of people that have been going down as, as agrarian population is, is much lower nowadays. So um, I think we saw that too. Uh, um, May Britt's question is like, why would you not want to grow your own food? Like, I don't understand that. You want to go to a store, that doesn't make sense. And so we see though more and more people um, not active in their own self-determination. So, um, I think the, the, a key point here is this idea of decoupling was really the first phase of economic, uh, of ecological economics, which was trying to still promote economic growth, but also um, a, at a relative decoupling as a lowering the use of resources as that was going on. Um, and so you have a biophysical model of the economy, that box that Herman Daly was trying to put around it, which we heard about this morning, which is, which is vital to our understanding of how humans uh, and the economy works within nature. 
And, um, but at the same time, as we saw in several slides, the great acceleration, and Dan showed us also some of these, that these trends are still continuing in the wrong direction, right? So um, everything is still, you know, we need to shift all of them at once and not just uh, think about them independently. Yes. Um, so we have not yet um, really started that transition. It's not discernible yet. And so I think that what's um, important here is that, uh, you know, this idea of transforming to be more holistic and more radical, um, and that the idea of decoupling, I, I like how she's put this there, is that the findings of social metabolism clearly demonstrates that a decoupling of economic growth and the use of natural resources is possible, but only very partially, that it's not going to solve the problem for us. Decoupling is not the entire basket, um, the only hammer, I should say, I'm using that terminology. Um, so more interdisciplinary work we've heard a lot, more transformative work, more holistic work are all part of what is necessary. So how um, and what can social metabolism do for that and how does having this transform paradigm modify in one's actions or behavior, speaking directly to the questions that I had asked her. Um, it would support analysis on different scales and levels of social organization. It would help dismantle the illusion of technological process and economic growth providing the solution. I think that's quite important one, um, again, changing your, your goals, your, your paradigm there. It would teach about pro uh, promising more differentiated intervention strategies. Um, this is also an interesting point that uh, um, viewing climate policies basically as a context contest, excuse me, between owners of the assets that accelerate climate change and owners of the assets that are vulnerable to it. And so there's this tension between the ones that want the change and the ones that don't want the change. And, and I think this is an important point too. We, let's be vocal. Praise the ones that are doing well and shame the ones that aren't doing well. Um, you, you know, get that in the public in the public discourse. Systems knowledge needs to be translated into actor-oriented strategies to to achieve the most improbable. So everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Um, okay, so I think you got a little bit of a flavor of what social metabolism um, perspectives uh, are, are doing, building on on and with uh, the ecological economists and trying to really shift the paradigm towards within the sustainable limits that. Uh, that the planet has. So um, those were Marina's comments. I know she'd have given them much more eloquently than I just did. But um, with that, let me turn the microphone over to Adil. Uh, Adil is um, a professor at uh, the Party School of Global Studies, the recently stepped down dean of the school, and now the recently promoted uh, president of the Friends of IASA in, in the US. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I did have a presentation and I did have some slides. Uh, I am not going to use any of them nor make any of those points because better people than myself have made all those points much better than I could have. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a great pleasure to be 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 at IASA. And, and it is, as was mentioned, I, I was a YSSP. I served for a little while on the council um, and, and now, uh, now serve with the um, Friends of IASA in the U.S. As, as the new president, which I'm uh, mightily proud of. So, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for holding this. I remember being at the 40th, and, and, and it's good to be at the 50th. Um, I, I, so happy birthday, Asa, like everyone. Uh, when I turned 50, my kids gave me a card, Helbert, and the card said 50 is the age when uh, you are too old to be young and too young to be old. And I think that's not a bad advice for Yasa either. So that's what I really want to talk about in some ways. What does 50 mean uh, for an organization like Yasa? And in answering your question about, I'm, I'm going to change the title of the panel slightly. The original one is Guidance for Action from System Science. Um, with your permission, I'm going to make it Guidance for Action for System Science. Um, what can System Science do? Uh, itself. I'm going to be provocative in the hope that I'm amongst friends. Um, and in that, I'm going to sort of call upon the spirit of Harvard Refa, who was mentioned, the first director of, of IASA, who I think, which is a spirit which is worth recollecting. Um, I do so because I was his student, but for other reasons too. Um, now, you know, in, in my tradition, as in all of yours, when you come to a birthday bash, you bring some gifts. Uh, and I have three. Uh, I have three, three gifts, three prayers, really, uh, for, for Yasa. Uh, 
And I'm just going to go through those in terms of thinking about system science and, and where it is and where it might want to be going. Uh, and as I said, I might be provocative, but I hope I'm amongst friends. My, my first gift, if you will, or my first prayer um, is, is that of restlessness. Uh, and, and I say this with some seriousness. Um, I, I hope, I hope uh, EASA not only remains restless, but becomes more restless. Um, it was created in a restless moment, and I think it needs to elevate that moment again. What do I mean by that? In many ways, not in many ways, in all ways, as we have seen, especially yesterday and today, there is so much to celebrate. In fact, there's more to celebrate than Albert and uh, Pavel and others were saying. Uh, IASA is a world leader, is a defining force in a whole number of intellectual areas. Uh, certainly on system science, it's helped define what we mean by it, not just in IASA, but in many places. Certainly on climate policy and climate science. Climate science is now done everywhere in the world. Uh, not only because of IASA in a particular way, but certainly because of IASA, including others. That's, that's beyond sort of any doubt. I served in the IPCC for too many years to know just how influential those ideas are. The danger, therefore, is that we will rest on our success. Uh, the danger, and this is why restlessness is important, that it is comfortable to be a leader. It is very convenient to be a leader, it is very dangerous to be a thought leader when the issue is changing right in front of us. Because the, the folks for it is most difficult to change are the ones who are the leaders. And in a number of these areas that we work on, but particularly on climate change, that is the challenge that requires the restlessness. The climate itself, not climate policy, unfortunately, isn't changing. Nothing is going to come out of COP27. I can tell you that right now. I hope I'm wrong. I've wanted to be wrong each of the last 27 times, too. Uh, but the climate itself is changing. Right? And we who do climate policy, I speak as a climate person here for a minute, having defined what we mean by climate in a particular way, continue to do it that way, which is not wrong, but which is no longer sufficient, right? And particularly, this has been alluded to a number of times, uh, I have been writing about, talking about, and I think I first talked about it at IASA um, uh, about 12 years ago or something, that we are now in the age of adaptation. We've probably been in the age of adaptation for at least a decade. The age of adaptation is not the opposite of the age of mitigation, it is the failure of the age of mitigation. What is adaptation? Adaptation is essentially the failure of mitigation. If you are not able to solve the problem, then you have to adapt to its impacts. Right? And that means that our work as system sciences has changed. And I'll come to that, that, that in a minute. I come from Pakistan. I've just sort of come from there. All of you have probably heard of the floods. I won't even give you those numbers. A third of the country submerged, a million houses damaged, uh, 33 million people displaced, 800,000 of them pregnant women, 2 million children uh, in, in, of those displaced undernourished, 40 billion in loss, so on and so forth. Right? Not all of that is about climate change. We are used to floods, but it is quite clear that a bunch of it is, right? And what the point about the gift of restlessness is that we need to therefore not only do what we have been doing, but change with this change, which I think climate science is simply not doing. In fact, climate science is very resistance, resistant to seriously talking about adaptation. Uh, I have lost friends on this topic. And there is a reason. We have all grown up as scientists who study the carbon molecule. And adaptation is not about the carbon molecule. Adaptation is about impacts, and most of the impacts are not about carbon. They're essentially about water, right? Not all of them, but most of what happens when climate changes. Most of the things are about water, which is why that other group that is talking about water is so important, right? What happens when climate changes? Uh, water rises, sea level rise. Water melts, glaciers. Water disappears, drought. Water falls from the sky like no one's business. 
extreme events and floods. That's climate change. None of that is then related to energy, except in the original cause. Right? There is a much more turbulent, a much more violent politics of climate that is emerging, including in Sharm el Sheikh. And therefore, the challenge for those doing climate science is the challenge of restlessness, of once again trying to redefine what we mean by climate science. Right? And again, this is not about not doing mitigation, because the less you do mitigation, the more you have to do adaptation. Right? I'll come to that in a minute. But, but that, to me, is the first uh, of those gifts. Let me, let me throw a second gift, if you will, or a second prayer, if you, if you allow me, uh, which is the, 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 the prayer of irreverence. May Iyasa remain irreverent. And that, too, is very difficult for an organization at 50 years of success, because you become the establishment. Right? 50 years is around where people become the establishment, the man, as they say in the US. Right? But that irreverence is important because IASA was created in a moment of irreverence. The idea that something like IASA could be created, where scientists from East and West could talk, in a period when politics was as turbulent as it is now, not as a comfortable haven for people who do system analysis, but as an irreverent place that shakes itself up and shakes people around it, that people look at it kind of because it is threatening, is really, really important. And that, I think, is the spirit uh, of, of, of Reva. Reva. What do I mean by irreverence? Here is the thing. I am not sure I buy all the things that have been said on this stage. I am not sure. The money part is right. The science part, I am not sure. I don't think science is, lack of science is the problem. So let's take climate change, which I'm going on with. Right? Is the climate changing? Is climate, are climate change problems happening because we don't know the science of climate change? I don't think so. We've known it for more than 100 years. There are plenty of things to know more about. But what's happening out there is not happening because we don't have enough science on climate change. It won't, if, if I had better models, even better models, even better science on climate change, do you honestly believe? that the world, in terms of climate change, will become better? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure Naki is so sure either. So why, isn't things hap why aren't things happening? This is the irreverent part. Not because, not just, we, we need more science. We need better science. But not because there isn't enough science, but because science isn't being translated into better decisions. Right? That's the spirit of Harvard Dreyfus. Right? The great hurdle is not the lack of science. It is the impact of the science we do have on decisions. That's why you know, Hans in the last se session was exactly right. right. And that requires irreverence to think about decision systems, natural, not just natural systems, not even just human systems, but why do we keep as a species, which is clearly not fully evolved yet, making bad decisions? Right? That's an essential Harvard Refa problem. That's an essential. One minute. Uh, okay. Last, 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 last one. So, so that I think we, we need to get to. And the last, last gift I have, I hope, I, uh, the prayer I have is the prayer of, of fearlessness. Fearlessness will be needed in the next 50 years because the big problems and the problems we deal with, right? Um, we, we, we know this from population already. We are seeing this in climate already. We'll see it more and more again, is the question of justice. Having once defined system science, EASA now has to redefine system science by fearlessly taking on the questions we usually don't want to take principally the question of justice. And here is the irreverent thought, if you allow me, that I want to leave you with. Resilience, very good. I agree. Thinking again about those floods, the 33 million people who are homeless, we in Pakistan are very proud of their resilience. Resilience is not a good thing. I don't want to be resilient. If my home has just gone away, I don't want you to help me become more resilient. I want you and Adil Najam to reduce our emissions 
so that I don't keep seeing these floods, right? What is the definition of resilience? Resilience is toughness so that when you are hit and hit again, you can rise again. That's not comfortable. Right? That is what I mean that the key question in all the, um, no, the key question in most of the questions we work with will have to be justice. And we as a scientific community have to stop being shy about trying to tackle questions of justice. Questions of justice are difficult because they're essentially questions of injustice. I wish EASA the very best. Happy birthday, everyone. Thank you very much for the, the comments and the, the, the three gifts. Um, and also, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, four, four system science as well, too. I, I totally agree with that. So, um, okay, so our next speaker will be Ursula Scharler, a professor in the School of Life Sciences at uh, KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. Thank you, Brian. So also from me, of course, happy birthday, Yasa, and thanks, Brian, for organizing this session. And I, uh, Adil's uh, talk resonated with me. One doesn't actually want to be resilient and one doesn't want to have to choose to be resilient, but uh, there needs to be uh, some justice in the world. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so um, these questions that Brian gave us to answer, I sort of reformulated them a bit and have a little bit to say from a, a mainly South African perspective to them. Uh, so uh, talking about the system sciences and the global ecological crisis. Uh, so yesterday we heard already so this divide about um, doing the science and knowing a lot, and uh, we just heard it now again. Uh, the next step would be trans the translating, um, where we're really bad about it, and then we do all this science and we tell it to somebody, and then we hope there is some action that comes from who knows where. So I agree with you also, me from the next COP, there's probably not, um, not a lot, or at least not nearly enough. So we do need these, these translators that we talked about. And one uh, example I want to give you is about the, the national funding arena in South Africa, where our funding proposals are assessed to quite a large extent how we communicate our science. And that can be communication to the public or to, to a certain community we worked with or to policymakers, whatever it may be. So that's actually 25%. 25% of the score of our proposal is this communication. So this is an, an, a decision made to really push us towards this communication. On the other hand, we have managers and decision makers at every level who do not like to make decisions, uh, who really are often unable to make decisions. So on the other hand, the scientists, the researchers, who are often not equipped for this, are pushed into this direction. And on the other side, we sit with managers already in place who do not know how to make these decisions. So this, this gap is something that really would need to be um, need to be uh, bridged. Um, so then I want to illustrate another example, so about economics and environment in South Africa. They're in two separate uh, governing, government departments, as in most nations. Uh, so we have this divided political, uh, these divided political agendas, but they're in the same political system. And this is an uh, um, uh, example about something called Operation Pakisa, which uh, is, um, was uh, brought to life in order to fast track the um, economic development of the country. And you see here, there are some, sorry, do we have a point also? If you push and hold the top one. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, so there are these, these various sectors that are in it. Uh, most of them are economic sectors, as you can see. And there's one about the ocean, so my background is marine sciences, so that's why I'm gonna home into that. And there are all these economic uh, parts to it, and one of them is about, uh, also about marine protection. And I just wanna illustrate how scientists managed to contribute to this agenda and perhaps also uh, change it a little bit. 
So this is about marine spatial planning. Uh, so for those who don't know, it's basically uh, collating all the information about the use of a certain piece of ocean and then looking at trade-offs, how this piece of ocean could be used best, best uh, both for protection and for economic gain. And the, um, the advantage that uh, came out of that is that now we have a Marine Spatial Planning Act that actually provides legislation that goes into this fast tracking the economic development, which is the term in itself makes every uh, environmental uh, scientist bristle, of course. And so we have this uh, marine spatial planning government struct governing structure. Now we actually end up with a lot of different uh, acts that govern our marine uh, resources, which is, would then of course be the next step to integrate those. So we go from contributing to one system that opens up having to contribute to more systems to make them more uh, governable. Uh, then another um, example I want to tell you about is Abalobi. So this is the integration of a socio-economic system with an environmental system. It's about small-scale fishermen, not fishermen and fisherwomen, uh, and how to support them in terms of the, their social system and their economic system. And uh, it is about, not only about the fishery science, that is an integra integral part, but it's also about, um, for instance, the, the tradition, the history, that's fish with a story, the marketing, post-harvest, and supporting. So a very nice integration of, um, of uh, different kinds of systems that talks directly to the livelihood of, um, of a community. Um, Another questions, uh, question we had is about uh, system science and transforming sciences. Um, uh, I think we heard uh, very nicely from Dan already, you know, which part of science actually needs transforming. Certainly not all sciences, but the sciences that, new sciences that we, that we need to answer these questions uh, better. And one, um, one of the things that we, we heard a lot uh, in the conference already about like big sort of global talk and global change and global systems. However, we, the, the local systems we shouldn't forget. There are, there are different contexts in which different um, recommendations work or do not work, and to find solutions, we of course have to take these local contexts into account. And, um, and uh, the, the uh, short-term solutions that we often ascribe to are often not working, so I want to illustrate that with one example that we, um, for instance, knowing the solution sometimes um, doesn't help us in implementing it. So in South Africa, um, our rivers and estuaries have a right to water, so a legal right to water. But what happens if we can't, uh, if we have it in the legislation, but how do we go about actually uh, implementing that. And just one example, I work a lot on estuaries, so for those who don't know, it's the last bit of river before it flows into the sea, and these are immensely one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. Um, when the, these estuaries provide uh, nurseries for other species in South Africa, more than half of the species we fish in the sea use these estuaries at, one, at, at some of the life stages, which means if we lose the estuaries, then we also lose those uh, species in the sea. And uh, the main pressure on these is the lack of freshwater inflow. So we are in a semi-arid country, there are a lot of dams on the rivers, there's less and less freshwater flowing in, which means the systems are not productive anymore. And so we have here uh, rainfall uh, over a couple of decades, which is diminish diminishing a little bit, but not so much. And this is the, the same timeline here, but then actually saying how much of this rainfall flows into this estuary and actually keeps this ecosystem going. And you see there isn't much, which means all the rain gets caught in the dam upstream. And this is what the dam looks like during drought, so that the 
coastline of the dam actually should be where the tree line is. And you see it's very, very low and there's actually already grass growing because it's been low for that long. So if there's water, it gets caught somewhere for human use, even that this ecosystem has a legal right to water. Um, then the next thing that we do is we have wastewater treatment works because of all the humans in the system. And we actually... Um, uh, put a lot of water of these wastewater treatment works into the river, but they are uh, highly polluted um, and um, uh, wastewater isn't treated as it should be. So we give always the, uh, the, the how do you say, the advantage, not the advantage, but the, the first step, the first thought is always about the humans, right? The human use and the waste products for the humans, even if we have it legally enshrined that it should be otherwise. But we don't know how to act on it. All right. And then short, la okay, then thanks. Then lastly, on uh, how uh, behavior and society and, and the general public. Um, so quickly, I think um, many people in the general public do not imagine alternative pathways or alternative lives or how things could be different. And I think one of the, one of the causes of this is that we, uh, many people are very bad in looking beyond uh, their little circle. And one of the causes of that is that our school uh, education is very, very limited. So I think all of those who had children trudging through mainstream education or having taught uh, students at university who have been through mainstream education, uh, we know schools work in silos. Schools do not teach uh, for the times now that we need the children uh, to be taught. And I want to echo, echo one of the uh, online presentations we had yesterday, as young as possible. It's, it's something that really needs to be enshrined in the thinking. And where, where scientists can also help in that is, uh, is to, to help design curricula to incorporate that into the schooling. So I won't go into that. But then uh, one, one thing, and we, we touched on this, this also with the justice, the individual goals, goals versus the system goals. So we can have our SDGs that are global. Uh, if we do not know how to act uh, individually and in a fair way, then, then we're not going to get there. We had a nice graph uh, this morning where we saw those countries that now use below one earth. Everybody wants to go to where the countries are that use five or six earths. People want to go there. People want to have the lifestyle. And, uh, and, and looking for designing alternative livelihoods to one that is using five or six earths, I think is a huge responsibility uh, that, we, that we have. And so my, just my last slide for the general public also, as, and for us, I think we need to imagine alternative futures even if they don't exist. So there's a lot of, uh, we, we're often very tunnel visioned and we don't have enough imagination of how things could actually be uh, different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, yes. Was this yours? Ursula, is that yours? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so moving then to the last speaker of the session, also somebody implicated in helping put all this together um, over the discussions we've had the last decade is Harold Katzmir. He's the director and founder of FA, FAS Research, which is based right here in Vienna, Austria. So Harold, only 10 minutes, so you remember, only 10 minutes. <laughs> so, or, well, uh, welcome everyone here. Uh, this is a really beautiful room here, but since it's so huge and big, the, the energy kind of dissipates here. So I hope you're still still awake, everyone here. Yeah, almost. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, what I would like to talk about is uh, what we at FAS Research call rough systems analysis, or uh, because we think that's our, our, a way to move our system thinking beyond the world of academia. And uh, this is a picture from our today's newspaper, Der Standard in German. Uh, and you see the world leaders are, uh, yeah, hanging around and t t discussing, obviously, 
um, difficult topics. Uh, I guess it's around the, uh, the, um, the attack on, on, on Poland, and our, uh, we, we re read about it. And what I think what this picture shows is uh, that uh, when you uh, compare our, excuse me, wait, wait a minute, okay. Look. When you look at it, and you say, is this the way to make a group decision or on uh, the wicked problems, on the meta crisis that, that, that we're facing? I think no. I mean, there's a complexity gap, the complexity of the problems that we're facing and the complexity our decision makers are capable are to, to organize. So there's, there's a gap, thinking about the law of requisite variety, Ashby's law, are, we're not there, and therefore decision making is a kind of, or many times guest working and spontaneous and are, um, yeah, and also about like the micro power structures or that, that you would see in those groups. Uh, so the question is why is systems thinking or systems analysis not more frequently applied in groups like that? I mean, why, why do they just like hang around and boo, and, and yeah, why is that? And I think we have to be aware that, uh, and here I'm completely with Dan, uh, that maybe science itself is part of the problem. So we are, have experienced a serious uh, uh, exponential growth of uh, scientific output over the last 300 years. So on the average, um, um, since the 1950s, we have a growth rate of 5%. So, uh, so we see our, we're doubling the output, 70 t uh, divided by five. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's like uh, every, every 20 years, uh, if I uh, uh, have calculated correctly, we, we're, we're doubling it. So we are part of the global accelerization problem. Science is the same, it's the same logarithmic curve that we are, we're part of it. We are, and, and with the with the the output uh, that we that we create, we create problems. I mean, think about like our, uh, the Feigenbaum number, so that the throughput, if you increase it, it would lead uh, more and more frequently to um, um, bifurcations uh, that would more sooner or later uh, lead to to chaos. Uh, so. And the other thing is, this is, I think, this is one of the most underestimated, or not underestimated, it's just like, or I, I should, people should know that our science and innovation output uh, as a super linear relationship with population density. I mean, I don't know, uh, we, we should know that, that our, <laughs> you simply, if you're living in a place or with a, uh, low density population, there is a exponential decoupling in the terms of your capacity to just like our, uh, stick with our developments that are happening in urban metropolitan areas and that's the main reason for the polarization that we see here. And science is part of the problem. Science is happening where you have our dense populations. And our, well, we know that our, we're talking about our polarization, that our, the system science themselves, come on. I mean, this is a completely fragmented world. I mean, this is not like, oh, the system science. I mean, YASA is one out of many other uh, system science communities. It's not the only one. And our, so we see a lot of our non-alignment, conflict, our, and power games over status and et cetera, et cetera. So fragmentation and uh, eventually polarization and fragmentation always are, creates a lot of pain and that's where our, the populists and the fascists and the authoritarianists are sourcing their political power. I just want to just like, we're, we're part of the problem. It's not our, and yeah, 
and already talking about problem and solutions, framing the world and looking through the lens of, looking at the world through the lens of there's a problem and we need a solution might already be the problem because uh, uh, we've, we are kind of uh, reproducing this uh, mechanistic worldview that we're uh, I've heard already about. So what could we do? Uh, we think and uh, our <laughs> We think that our, there is our different types of our knowledge, different types of our information, different types of describing the world with different synthetic and analytic depth. So you can have evidence, or there is like this or, uh, scientific way to look at the world, there's per s personal experience, and then there's emergence. What do we mean by that? I mean, you have different philosophies. Science are, leans towards naturalism when you have more like a subjective view on the world, it's phenomenology, and our if you really like or encounter the, the emergence, the surprises are that, that we are facing when we look, when we engage with the world, it's pragmatism and our, it's, different, it's, it's, it's different perspectives and with the different perspectives came along different kind of data. And this is what I actually, I think, are, um, is here important. So we have the big data trend, big data, the bigger the better. More is different. But we have also, when you think about Nora Bates and law, what we like, and I think it's a great or wording, warm data, subjective data, and we have rough data. Uh, uh, rough data that are linked with our, uh, and we've heard about that, there's just examples. When you do a participatory impact analysis, when you do like our, uh, what what uh, we, we've heard a lot about adaptive co-management. When you, this is like unsharp rough or data that you get. Uh, you could have like interviews, storytelling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Snowball analysis also kind of like uh, uh, working with warm data. And then you have like where the hardcore science are uh, uh, is or is or as its its domain. Uh, everything is linked with our also artificial intelligence, uh, systems dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, it's all also our, uh, part of um, uh, plural theory of plural rationalities. Uh, you, 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 but based on the time, I just like have to uh, move on and just like I have to skip this one here. So what is rough data? Rough data is that you take a look at the world through squinting your eyes. It's like planning out the details. And this is like when you squint, and this is when you, when you do a workshop on landscape painting. This is what I, or, um, and for photography, the first thing is you, you learn to squint your eyes because when you squint the eyes, you just see like the most basic and most essential tonal distribution uh, that you would start with when you draw a picture. So you yeah, have those, those rough uh, shapes. And squinting is very important because it helps us that we are, are, are not losing ourselves in the details, but we actually are see things that we that are that are good enough that, that the resolution is, is, is good enough okay you could you could argue if you don't know that this is Mona Lisa we don't know this is Mona Lisa but you will see it's a woman it's a person so you would still uh, 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 have understanding and and of, of or you could decode the picture and again here it's all about like forget perfection forget elegance. Let's squint together our eyes and let's uh, uh, find, figure out what we see together here and now. And this is what we call, uh, 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 what, 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 what we call like rough data analysis, that you have a, a, a simple matrix where you have like in this example, this was like a, um, a rough data, we call it situation room, I will 
talk maybe have one minute to talk also about what we call a situation room because we, I think we talk far too, far too much about the future. We have to talk about what's, what's here and now. This is like a, a, a simple matrix on how to, uh, uh, how to uh, foster and accelerate the idea of circular, circularity, circular economy, multi-stakeholder group, and with the software, and we did this analysis within 50 minutes. Again, like 50 minutes, multi-stakeholders, people don't have time. And you see just like how those success factors or the, how those leverage points uh, influence each other. And of one minute. And of course, you see the red ones. This is where we disagree. So, so we, we, we use uh, rough methods to also uh, uncover where we have, where we have our uh, assessments that bring in this, what we have heard, this idea of uh, also uh, um, 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 not, not just disagreement, but there's like an insecurity, there's like risk, there's something where we cannot predict uh, because we see already that there's diverging positions. And this is like a, an example. Make very simple, very simple systems maps, not the complex ones. Dare to be simple, dare to, and I know this is not what, what brings you an article in a, in a scientific journal, but this is what, what, what creates uh, systems awareness or situation awareness among a group of, uh, of people who are not, who are not scientists. That's your, the, 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 the key the key point. So uh, I also want to, this is where I want to start, or uh, where I want to end. Uh, this is also uh, linked with our, uh, by the way, what Bas Halling, because we are at IASA, uh, is uh, called like adaptive co-management. We have to bring in people, our, and they have first to report on what they see here and now, what they're sensing. And then we have to start to connect what they see. And our, having said, this is how I want to end, uh, we talk about scenarios and adaptive uh, uh, projections and how the future might unfold. Uh, it's all about how can we strengthen uh, the, our capacity to respond to what's coming and to respond together requires shared situation awareness, shared systems awareness, uh, and this is what we can our, uh, uh, support or this is what we can uh, develop through rough systems analysis. So again, dare to be simple, uh, that's my that's my message here, and of course, it was the wrong PowerPoint slides that I uploaded. I had a completely different presentation. So, uh, anyway, Paul knows that. He's <laughs> Okay, thank you. We'd have never known if you wouldn't have said anything. Um, thank you. So, um, we have probably five or ten minutes still. I smell food already though and I know we're already late, but to keeping t with our two hours, we started half hour late. Um, so are there some comments or questions that anybody would like to have? I don't know about online if anything has come in, but um, anybody want to get the discussion started um, in the house here? I think we heard several times about some advice for science and some of the leading by example things that we can do um, differently. So that's that's good. Yeah, Reinhardt, go ahead. Is there? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> Sorry, it's getting late. I need some food. Uh, inspirational talks. Uh, maybe too ideal. So, agree. It was very nice and interesting, relevant. Maybe too ideal that Yaza should focus on the also on adaptation. I think you don't only mean climate adaptation. You mean probably the bigger uh, scheme of things, right? Unfortunately, I think YASA has done adaptation in many spheres, in many domains. And as you're from Pakistan, we know what's now being negotiated at the Climate Summit is the next level. It's not preventing, it's not avoiding, but it's dealing with the unavoided and the unavoidable. 
So IPCC in Working Group 2 also said there's unavoidable impacts, climate-related and other impacts. So I think we need to go to that, and that has to do a lot with climate justice that you mentioned. We're doing a bit of work there, but yeah, it's, it's a tough domain. It's a tough territory that we need to act. And we should, of course, not give up and forget about the prevention in many regards, not only climate. So I think we're getting there, but indeed, yeah, what do we need here? And I think we probably need Harold, right? And I think the photo was really evocative, right? It was really telling us it's, it's about the rough data and so on. So anyway, quick comment and maybe you know, any more reflections would be nice. Thanks. It was the only one right now, so go ahead. Sure. Unless, no, I... I no. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm in no position to give Yasa advice on what to do. But what I'm trying to say here is our field is changing. And it's going to become more tur turbulent. You're exactly right. Lots of people, Yasa included, have done adaptation. But I kind of see this, you know, there's a lot of people who are trained to work on mitigation. All my students are. For 30 years, I've been producing people <laughs> to make models and do work on mitigation. Now, when we see this age of adaptation, many of them aren't really ready for it, and therefore the natural human impulse is, let me keep doing what I know, the hammer thing, right? That was mentioned earlier. So my, what I'm trying to alert here is that something is happening now. The age, adaptation also, and I think you rightly pointed out, mitigation is necessarily global, right? A molecule has an origin, but doesn't have a flag. A molecule is a molecule is a molecule. Adaptation is necessarily local, right? And even more than resilience, it becomes a question of vulnerability. That's why it highlights the justice argument. In mitigation, justice was still easier. Your, you can cut emissions cheaper. I will pay you and get your credits. But now you're talking about floods, and you're talking about droughts, and you're talking about glaciers, and so on and so forth. So not only is climate politics becoming messier, as we are seeing, it's becoming more contentious. I am suggesting climate science is also going to become more contentious. Right now, we are all polite with each other. But my friends essentially say, but you're talking development, not climate. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes, I'm talking development, which is climate. Right? That's, that's, that's the space in which someone, I hope, will redefine climate policy, just as we have redefined it many times before, to, to a more granular level. Thanks. That's a couple of questions now. Joanne, I saw. So let's take a couple, and then Pat and, and Gerald, yeah. We'll get you next. Joanne, Joanne first, right behind. Oh, you're right there, okay. Thank you for the fascinating presentations. and. It's on, yeah. I yeah. Uh, would also like to know more about rough data, but I would like to link this uh, adaptation mitigation uh, debate or topic. And I think maybe the uh, it's, it's a politically contested point maybe, but this is where justice comes into picture. Of course, one part of both adaptation and mitigation is technological aspect, but we then have to somehow also address the social aspect uh, in a sense that the uh, mitigation uh, from the high consumption segments of society uh, has to flow towards, uh, it's maybe a bit abstract a thing I'm trying to say, this has to flow towards enabling adaptation for the low consumption segments or those who are already suffering. Thank you. So a transfer. Gerald, do you want to, while we're here, one in the front. So this is um, uh, addressed primarily to Adil, but also to Harold a little. Um, I'd like your thoughts about the prospects for integrating uh, system science and systems thinking. So just to take your uh, map, uh, systems thinking that I've been working in for 35 years is really at the top of your, uh, your diagram there. And a lot of system science is down at the bottom, uh, bottom right. And the trouble is with systems thinking is it's kind of abandoned the bottom right territory and only uh, working up there. Um, what it offers... Um, in terms of justice, though, is there's 30 years' work there about how to conceptualize the understanding between uh, linking boundary judgments and values. Uh, it's, there are theories of conflict and marginalization and a lot of approaches for how to intervene on those things. So really, you have got the cap capability there if, if it's possible to do, if it's possible to do. 
Try to respond, or, or to Pat's point also about the fairness, or. Uh, I guess that our, I mean, there is our really something intimidating for a lot of people when we talk about modeling. It's just itself, the wording, it's just like freaks people out. So, our, so what I uh, try to do is to create or to, to to, to, as I said, to dare to reduce systems thinking up to a scale where the threshold to, to engage in this kind of analysis is, is, is really minimal. So, so you can, so that non-academics, et cetera, start to, to appreciate it because uh, Sometimes I'm just like when, when, when we do a session, a situation room session, I, I ask people if I would wake you up at 3 o'clock in the night and it's about to solve, I don't know, whatever problem, uh, what would be the first thing that comes to your mind? And the interesting thing is when you have 12 people in the room, you get you get those five up to seven really decisive variables. You collect them. And, you, and then I'm then I'm then I'm choking and saying, well, you know, you can go, go to bed again. You can s continue to sleep. So people, there's like, but the important is that we don't get into the trap of consensus. That's why we you have to highlight where we disagree. But we can. So this is not just like. Uh, so it's it's less about the whole thing. What we do is not less about finding consensus, but broadening the spectrum, spectrum of what we can tolerate, accept. That's like, it's all about that because, and, 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 and learn to live with the messiness that, that, that's in there. Uh, but I, uh, uh, the problem is, again, as I said, I mean, you don't can publish a paper where you bring in um, uh, uh, a stakeholder group. You can, yeah. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I'm just saying when you're not innovating on methodology and you do something spectacular. So we, when we do this analysis, we really like try to limit it to just like our, uh, our, our uh, sim very simple mathematics, not talking about fancy stuff, but saying you're like, you're, you're so, so not talk about our autocatalysis and so, but it's in the, it's, it's there. So uh, I just want to encourage us to, Dare to, to yeah, to 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 be simple. Okay. I repeat myself. And I, and I also want to thank you in advance that tomorrow you're running one of those sessions yeah. for a small group of us. And, so and we we're going to do to this tomorrow online, um, and and you're invited to participate. And it's all about what are their key leverage points to our uh, advanced systems thinking and decision making beyond academia and the role of business politics etc so w w what to do when we are when, when we would when we would be woken up at three o'clock yeah in the night so uh, that's tomorrow at nine tomorrow at nine Otto, you wanted to have a response. Uh, three o'clock we should do it we should have done it at three o'clock <laughs> if i can I, I, i'm very grateful that you're making this this point about system thinking and system analysis i think as a species we are better at system thinking uh, as a subspecies meaning researchers we are not <laughs> yet fully connecting the thinking we have with the analysis because we don't have the tools, we don't have the numbers we, we, we have. And, and that's what I'm saying, that it will become more complex. Well, not complex that there'll be more lines, but some of the convenient things taken out can't be taken out um, anymore. Uh, but th that is why, the, the reason I kept saying Harvard Refa, the, the, the challenge is in the negotiation of the science into the decision, right? You see this with climate, you see this with many areas that sort of this, this idea of negotiation as a system, decision making as a system for global issues. Our unstated theory is, if I get the science right, somehow people will make the right decisions. We have 5,000 years of evidence that that doesn't happen. Right? And, and that is why we need to look at negotiation and decision seriously as systems. Very, very briefly, the presentation I didn't give was on COVID. 
and, and what can we learn from COVID? One thing we learn is the science was amazing. Faster than nearly anyone imagined and with cooperation, we got reasonably good vaccines. We got it after the crisis. Doesn't help us with climate because there ain't going to be a climate vaccine, <laughs> right? But what was one of the first big casualties of COVID? Multilateralism. 75 years of institutions of cooperation, all of us individually, not just our countries, shunned in a minute. Mask, airports closed, don't come near me, don't you enter my country. We couldn't even get countries in, within Europe to have the same rules on entry and exit. Right? This was one of the most spectacular failures of international cooperation when we were hit by the, f the largest global crisis of our lifetime, right? which was simply a rehearsal of the other crises coming. Mm -hmm. That's what I, why I'm saying sort of we need to think about systems uh, even broader, which is not a criticism of where we are. What I'm saying is we've done a lot, but it's about to become much more tense. Right? One, one point, because Albert is, is, is staring at me. Money was the other lesson of COVID. Money is never the problem. Anyone, any donor who tells you don't, they don't have money is a liar. I'm sorry. It's, they're lying. What they're really saying politely to you is, we don't want to give our money to you. We are ready to give it to someone else. When you got COVID, it took the US Congress nine days to dream up a, bill, a trillion dollars and five days to spend it. If the 100 billion can't come for climate, it's not because the money isn't there. It's because despite what we say, we really don't believe it is existential. The moment we do, voila, money will come, right? 6.25 trillion just in the US on COVID. Once we believed it was real, the money shows up. So when people tell you they don't have the money, they're just being polite. <laughs> they just don't want to give it to me. Thank Thanks, Otto. Um, Ursula, you wanted to have a response. Last word then. Thanks. I just wanted to say one more thing about the adaptation, the justice, and the fairness. And thanks for bringing up the money, because that's exactly where it is, right? So the science also does not point out properly where, what we can do. Right, so it's not helped with uh, we have another flood somewhere and so many people died and so many people are without homes. It doesn't really bring it home. Or in Africa, so many people live below $5 a day or whatever it might be. It really does not bring it home. And I think these, these sort of broad and globalization of the issues and just bringing them in broad strokes is also not helping us. What we need is, is solutions for local solutions for the people that live there. Like you say, adaptation is local and can only be local. And if the money is not there, then it's not because it's not there, and I fully agree, but because it, it is not um, a big enough issue for those who have the money. Okay? So, and I think we are up for some tough conversations about this because obviously we uh, cannot uh, carry on as it is, and especially when uh, some part of uh, the globe starts now li living less comfortably, perhaps with climate change. Um, we might see a situation as during COVID, who knows, that we uh, close our borders more. Uh, but we, in the long run, we will not escape. And I think science has a lot to contribute to that, but we're not there yet to actually contribute substantially to these issues. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and close the session and uh, go to lunch. So thanks again, everybody.